Um, okay, so I guess we'll get started. Um, so let me just do a little uh, reminder of what we saw. Ah, I have to write bigger. It's big enough. Um, so we saw that, uh, let's do this for a second. Um, quantum spin liquid phases um, had uh, have entanglement. Okay, uh, this means essentially that there are a large quantum superpositions of states. Uh, and so, in other words, that they are uh, not product states. Uh, so, they're not uh, ordered. At least, uh, there is no, the moments on each spin is not equal to the, the full moment. They're not ordered, okay. Um, okay, so that's uh, what we've seen. Um, and because they're not ordered, uh, we might want to have frustration because otherwise we know that we can very easily uh, solve the um, uh, pairwise interactions and then we just get a, an, ordered, uh, a, an ordered state, which is not what we want. Okay, so um, one of the, I, I promised I would give you uh, some take home messages, which one uh, could um, try to remember. Um, uh, if, nothing went through of what I'm going to say for the next few lectures. So some very important points. Uh, are that these phases are stable to perturbations. Um, they are uh, independent um, of uh, the existence of symmetries. So uh, here, you know, the only, th the only thing I've ever mentioned in terms of defining a quantum spin liquid and what the important particles, uh, uh, the important features are of a quantum spin liquid is because it came from entanglement. And so in particular, um, uh, quantum spin liquids can be topological phases, uh, but there uh, it is called uh, intrinsic topological order. They don't all have to be uh, topologically ordered, but a lot of them are. Uh, but this is very different from uh, what you've seen uh, in the lectures by Jean Noël or a uh, lecture by uh, Mark yesterday, where the, um, the fact that you had topological properties depended on the existence of symmetries. And as soon as the symmetry was gone, then there was no notion. Uh, so there was no... Uh, the topological properties that these phases had, so topological insulators, they depend on the existence of symmetries. And if you break those symmetries, then they can't exist anymore. So this is entirely different. Uh, you don't need any symmetries for this uh, so-called intrinsic topological order to exist, okay? Uh, there we go. And... Um, The, uh, the Hamiltonians are local, well, and since on this again, Hamiltonians are local. Um, 
but the uh, important consequences are non-local. In particular, one of the key features of quantum spin liquids is the existence of fractional particles Uh, which are always created locally, but then they can uh, move apart from one another and have their own existence uh, and have these fractional quantum numbers, but their existence relies on an underlying uh, entanglement. Uh, okay, and what we saw also uh, was that um, a good uh, description to um, uh, involve these fractional particles was gauge theory. So gauge theories uh, often em emerge uh, from the description of quantum spin liquids. Okay. Um, all right. And another thing I want to say is that uh, fractional particles, which is kind of a, I don't know if I can say it's a defining character of quantum spin liquids, but uh, maybe to a good approximation it is. Um, but this actually, unfortunately, leads to very non-specific signatures in experiment, okay? So, um, this fractional particles, there are very many different types of quantum spin liquids. Fractional particles, which may be of different kinds, are present in all of these quantum spin liquid phases, but they don't lead to very sharp signatures, unfortunately, in experiment. So, in order to have, like, non- um, to have smoking gun signature of a quantum spin liquid, one is going to have to basically know which type of quantum spin liquid you're after. All right. So um, now I'll, I'll give you, uh, we'll work through a, a specific example uh, of a quantum spin liquid. And this first example is going to be so-called quantum spin ice. So quantum spin ice. Um, so for this uh, model, uh, like for many uh, models actually, uh, because we uh, need frustration, uh, the geometry is important. So the uh, geometry of the lattice um, is important. And in this case, uh, as I briefly mentioned yesterday, it's the pyrochlor lattice. Um, and this lattice is a lattice of corner-sharing tetrahedra, which I tried to draw on the board yesterday. So this is a 3D picture uh, where you have four sides here, and then say this one is, is out of the board, so then uh, this keeps going through this side here, and so this one would be into the board. And then you can keep drawing this lattice, and this fact that there are these tetrahedra, you can actually span the whole space with this lattice. Uh, okay. Um, so, um, uh, so let's uh, just make sure I do everything in order. Um, okay. And so at the uh, at the vertices, so in this model, at the vertices of each one of these uh, tetrahedra, there is a spin one-half okay, on each side. Uh, and uh, one is going to need spin orbit coupling uh, because one needs an isotropic, mo an, an isotropic model. Uh, and in particular, uh, the largest term in this model is actually the icing model on the spiral lattice. And so the first term in the Hamiltonian that one wants to consider is of the form uh, JZZ sum over nearest neighbors uh, SIZ SJZ. Okay. So it is the icing model, and this term here is antiferromagnetic. That is, the spins want to point uh, the SIZ and SJZ uh, want to be opposite. I have opposite signs. Uh, and this is actually a classical model, which in fact is called classical spin ice, uh, 
um, because uh, all the terms commute uh, in this Hamiltonian since we only have the z component. So on each side, uh, you only have SIZ, and two spins on two different sites uh, obviously commute. Okay. Um, so uh, in order to get... Uh, yes, I'll come to this. Okay. Um, so uh, one of the... Um, one of the uh, one of the material types where this so this could be just taken as a model. We're of course allowed to just choose this to exist on this uh, on this lattice uh, as a model, and to choose actually the z direction in whatever direction we want if we're uh, just um, being theorists. But actually, uh, this model is realized in uh, materials, uh, and the materials are the some uh, rare earth power chlors. Um, which uh, I believe Colin will talk about uh, this afternoon a little bit. Uh, and so I won't uh, go into too much detail, but these materials have two parochlor uh, lattices uh, plus some oxygens. Um, and, um, uh, but the, there is only one uh, parochlor lattice which has some spin halves uh, on it. Okay. So, um, in, in theory, one can just restrict oneself to having spin halves on this uh, on this lattice. Uh, and um, um, and so those materials uh, which are which have only this classical uh, term. I mean, it's a little bit more complicated, but the lowest uh, order model, say, of these guys uh, has this form, and they're, for example, a homium titanate and this prosium titanate. Uh, where the spins are the on the homiums or the dysprosiums. Uh, and uh, actually, uh, it is important that uh, because now we're not dealing with some uh, just some model anymore, but we're uh, thinking about an actual material, an actual real symmetries uh, of this lattice, that actually the z-axis are not, it's not a global z-axis where you would take some frame uh, x, y, z here, uh, but these are actually local axes. So basically what I should really have written, but it's, uh, it would be uh, make it too uh, cluttered, um, is that I should actually have written s, i, z, i, s, j, z, i, just to point out that uh, the direction z actually depends on the site which you sit on, okay? So uh, more precisely, I'm going to tell you what the z-axis is. So if you take two, uh, just these two uh, tetrahedra now, uh, and if you manage to th see in three dimensions a little bit, uh, you'll actually see that if I take the center of these tetrahedron and the center of this other tetrahedron, then I have an axis here, okay, which goes through this site in the middle, which contains a spin one half, and that defines my z-axis. So if this is site i, the local z-axis here is going to be zi. But now if I want to know what the local z-axis of this site j is here, I have again uh, to take um, the, the neighboring tetrahedron here and again, take the middle of this tetrahedron, and that now defines my new uh, JZ axis. Uh, Z, <coughs> sorry, ZJ uh, axis. Is that okay for everybody? Okay. Sorry? Um, so these are a unique way to define a Z axis on a, on a J site, on a given site. Good point. Okay. Um,
So this is okay now for everybody? All right. Um, but in fact, yes. It's well, it's only in the math class, so it's, I, I think it's maybe a three plus ion, which means L is probably like your bias, and S is like by far. So how do we make two polymer ether similar? Yeah, so this is a good point. Uh, so it's not, um, so for these ions, actually, they're classical, and they're not actually really spin half ions. Okay. Uh, but what we'll see later is indeed they're in the lanthanide series, and indeed they have L equals 3, and indeed they have large S, but however, we'll see how we can model how they are actually effectively spin halves. So it's not the... Yeah. Uh, the way the physics works for these materials is a little bit different because actually this term comes from dipolar interaction. This is the dominant interaction. But for quantum spin ice materials, we really have effective spin halves. Um, yeah, I'll so show you in a sec. Oh, okay, so these guys are classical, whereas the thing on the left hand side is like uh, uh, ion uh, Yeah. Um, but do you mean literally that the crystal fields will split the level of the. Uh, yeah, the crystal fields are going to split the levels, and so you're going to get an effective low lying doublet, which is a spin half. Okay. Um, but for these guys, actually, the physics is that of the polar spin ice, where the dominant term is actually this one, and we don't care about any of the other ones. And there is a single ion and isotropy, which makes sure that you actually only have these guys in the Hamiltonian, and that all the quantum terms, which I'll add later, are just tiny. <laughs> Sorry. Um, yeah, maybe I wanted to oversimplify a little bit. OK, uh, so we have these guys, but in fact, um, and so we have these local z-axes, but this is just important for being able to write down the symmetries. And after this, actually, if you're not comfortable with this, you could just imagine that I've rewritten these terms in the proper local basis, and you can forget that they even came from local bases. Once you've written down the model, you can actually forget about it. Uh, all right, so uh, <coughs> what we'll want to do is actually solve this Hamiltonian, but by which we mean find the ground state of this Hamiltonian, okay? And I mentioned it was just a classical Hamiltonian, so those states are also just classical, and so they're just uh, vectors pointing in some directions, and it's a product state. It's going to be a product state, or so many product states in this case. So let me just take one tetrahedron and try to solve, try to figure out what the, how the spins should arrange to minimize the energy of this guy. So I'm going to take a, a single a single tetrahedron, okay? And I'm going to label the sites on it uh, 0, 1, 2, and 3. Uh, and I'm going to have the Hamiltonian here uh, just for this. Uh, so there are going to be six bonds in this Hamiltonian, and I want to minimize the energy of the sum over these six bonds. Okay, so it's going to be JZZ, SIZ, SJZ. And this actually uh, can be rewritten uh, JZZ over 2 uh, sum over, uh, well, I'll just write it down explicitly. So S0, okay, plus S1 plus uh, S2 plus S3 squared plus a constant. Because if you actually uh, expand this out uh, because of the square here, you actually get um, uh, S0, Z squared, S1, Z squared, etc. but these are just constants. And then you just multiply um, uh, every one of these terms, and so you get twice S0, S1, twice S0, S2, etc. And so this can just be rewritten this way, plus a constant term. Okay. Um, and now this becomes actually much simpler to solve, because we know JZZ is positive. And so in order to minimize uh, the energy uh, of this uh, you know, one tetrahedron here, uh, we just need to make this equal to 0. And we know the spins are just classical variables, since all the terms in this Hamiltonian commute with one another. 
so that uh, each spin here is just plus or minus one half. Okay, just classical variables. And so um, uh, what we need to do here is actually to take two of these spins uh, being plus one half and two of these spins being minus one half. It's basically the only way that we can make this term be zero. And it's gonna be because all of this is positive, this is what we need. Uh, but if you, you can choose any of these guys to be, it doesn't matter which ones you choose to be plus one half and which ones you choose to be minus one half, okay? Uh, and so there then, uh, you have to choose two spins out of four, and that means there are six possible states um, uh, which will satisfy this condition. And these uh, six states uh, are the six, so there are the six uh, two in, two out, and this is because uh, we have this local geometry. Uh, you could also just think about them as uh, two up, two down. But this is kind of the terminology for classical spin, right? Two down states. So let me draw them, okay? And so all of these states are degenerate. They all minimize the energy of one tetrahedron. Uh, and the way they look is as follows. Can you see red chalk or is red bad? Is red good? Good? Okay. Uh, and so we can choose, say, this one in and this one out. Okay. Or we can rotate all of this. So another uh, state, for example. Uh, would be this guy, this guy, this now would be pointing in, it's hard to draw, okay. And you can choose any one of these you want, and in fact you could just put colors, uh, this say would be the, you know, the brown ones, and this would be the empty ones, and similarly here, um, would have this and this of this. Okay, and so these are like the in, in, out, out. Okay. And so there are six of these. Uh, you can try to draw them yourself. Yeah. Why do you think so that's because in the quantum spin ice model, there are gonna be more terms, but this is gonna be the dominant term. And so we're gonna be basically doing perturbation theory out of this. Uh, and this we can solve. So it's always good to do perturbation theory out of something you can solve. And this is, um, uh, this is the dominant term. So this is justified. And in fact, in these, uh, in these systems here, all the other terms are uh, extremely small, if not zero. Um, yeah, good question. Uh, who, is uh, who is talking? Uh, sorry? Uh, we're going to get an effective Hamiltonian out of this manifold. Um, for the Hamiltonian, we have a solution, yes. Yeah. So can you, um, I was asking if you could speak a little louder, or maybe I can repeat the question, but I'm not sure I understand the question exactly. So. Uh, 
this is ground state. Uh, yeah. Yeah. All right. Um, okay. And so this here, for for now, I actually only just solved one tetrahedron. Uh, but the magic about having corner sharing lattices is actually that you can basically extend the solution to the whole lattice. And because this is because the Hamiltonian here over the whole lattice, uh, you can actually, instead of uh, writing it uh, uh, this way, okay, um, you can actually um, uh, write it as the sum over tetrahedra, and then the sum over ij belonging to that tetrahedra, so only the bonds in this tetrahedron, s, i, z, s, j, z. Okay. And this here, we know through this rewriting over there in terms of a square, we know how to solve. Okay. So what this tells us is actually that the full uh, Lattice uh, ground states are going to be uh, are um, are um, the states uh, where um, every tetrahedron is two in two out, okay? Uh, and this is actually possible to realize uh, in an extensive fashion, okay? Uh, because if you take now one tetrahedron here, and then keep drawing. Um. Okay. Uh, you can choose, say, this one to be in, and this one to be in, and these two to be out. And then here, I can, I already have one spin pointing in here. Well, I can choose, say, now this one pointing in. And now it means the other two have to be out, okay? And now I have one which is out, and I can choose whichever one here, and then these two can be in, and these two can be out. So you can see that the degeneracy is actually very large because instead of choosing this one to be in again, I could have chosen this one, and this would just have kind of reshuffled uh, everything again. Okay. Uh, okay. Uh, exactly. Yes. There is a, there is a, that's what I was going to say. So the degeneracy uh, scales like n. So the degeneracy. is extensive, it scales like the number of the tetrahedra, uh, but indeed there was a calculation uh, which tells you what the degeneracy exactly is because as Mark was pointing out, uh, I was showing you that you had all this freedom, but actually when you come back, eventually you're gonna have some constraint because at the end, uh, when you come back to this tetrahedron, if I keep going in a circle here, or rather it's a hexagon, uh, if I, this is gonna be determined somehow by the other two tetrahedra, so then there'll be two constraints. Uh, these two guys are gonna be determined already, so I won't have any choice for this tetrahedron. But this calculation was uh, done by Pauli, and actually I don't have it here, but there's uh, Paul Ling, yes. <laughs> because yeah, he studied water ice, which works the same way. Um, and uh, anyway, so there is a degeneracy, which have s so there's some coefficients, but the, uh, the scaling is proportional to the uh, number of tetrahedra or number of, of spins. Y 
Yeah. Well, there are many, many states that are degenerate. <laughs> and so then you have a very large entropy which goes like the number of, uh, yeah. So <coughs> the degeneracy is exponentially large in the, in the number of uh, tetrahedra. Okay, uh, that's good. Uh, so we've seen now that uh, basically classical spin ice is a model of, uh, is a statistical model of a very large number of degenerate uh, ground states. Okay. And so there's been lots and lots and lots of work, uh, particularly because it's very relevant to experiments since actually they are known classical spin ices. But one thing I do want to point out is actually that the, um, um, a classical spin ice is not at all a quantum spin liquid, okay? Uh, because quantum spin liquids actually are single degenerate ground states, which are a quantum superposition of classical states, whereas, uh, of, of product states, whereas classical spin ice is just a classical Hamiltonian with a very large number of degenerate states. So that's very different. Yes. Absolutely, yeah. So there are two types of tetrahedra here. So it's all just a matter of notation, okay? Um, so here I'll say, so there are two t types of tetrahedra. There are tetrahedra that are up, and there are tetrahedra that are down, okay? And actually, uh, if you take the centers of this, of the tetrahedra here, that forms a diamond lattice. Diamond lattice has two sites per unit cell. Um, that corresponds to the up and the down tetrahedra. And so say I have decided that the ones I like best are the up tetrahedra, and so I decide that in means in for up tetrahedra, and it means out for down tetrahedra. So once you've decided this labeling, um, then you're okay. But this just, this is because I didn't want to write spins already, but say what I really should have written is this way. Okay? Just uh, notation. All right. So uh, let us ask now what the excitations are here. Uh, so what are the excitations above this degenerate manifold? Okay. Um, so excitations. Uh, well, the excitations, again, because we have an ordered state, they're gonna essentially going to be spin flips. But here... Maybe I should write ordered. So spin flips. Um, but because there are actually very many, many degenerate states, um, in the when you actually have a little bit of temperature, then the system is going to thermally fluctuate between all of these states, and so there is actually a better way to describe uh, what the excitations in this very large um, degenerate manifold are, okay? And those are the uh, so-called uh, monopoles. And so I'll explain to you how this works. Okay. Uh, yeah, let's say it now it's zero, okay? But uh, the interesting properties of this system come when you are um, uh, at non-zero temperature, so a little bit above the zero, a little bit above zero temperature, where all the the system is going to be able to thermally fluctuate between this manifold. So actually, what you see here is that um, this actually breaks the third law of thermodynamics, because at zero temperature we should have a zero entropy. Okay, uh, and so the, what the way the system resolves this is actually 
it, it freezes into some state when you go down to low temperature. So maybe there's some defects or something. And so the system actually freezes into one uh, of this many a degenerate ground states. And so there's just been a lot of work uh, on this, but this is really um, not what will, what will be of interest to us in this quantum spin liquid uh, lecture. But what's important here is what are these uh, monopole excitations? So what's a kind of uh, very interesting uh, about this system? Okay. So um, as I mentioned, uh, so let's say I'm gonna take this guy. So this I said was, so this would be out. So it would be an up spin. And let me now uh, create a spin flip here. So that would be an elementary excitation out of this one ground state in this very degenerate manifold. And so uh, if I flip this spin here, so it's going to become, uh, do a spin flip. So it becomes a down spin now. I take this from a down spin. So it means that I've actually taken this guy from being uh, empty to being full in my notation, right? So now what you see uh, actually here is that now we have three uh, red spins and only one white spin. And so this actually doesn't belong to the ground state manifold. Okay, that makes sense because, um, uh, well, that makes sense because it's an excitation. So it doesn't belong to the ground state manifold. And what we've also done here is we've actually also screwed up that tetrahedron, which is no longer in a two in, two out configuration, okay? And so what we say is that we have two defects. We have a charge here. I'll just make a little star to say that it's a defective tetrahedron. And this is another defective tetrahedron. Okay. And so if you kind of remember, try to make connections with what I said yesterday, what you see is that I've created locally with a spin flip uh, two tetrahedra that are defective. Maybe that rings a bell, okay? But still they're close to one another, so you know, that's fine. But now if I decide uh, to make, and so this actually, because I made a spin flip, uh, this has cost us an energy uh, JZZ, okay? Uh, of order JZZ anyway, uh, because we've, um, we've uh, screwed up um, some bonds. So that has an energy, so the energy of that, energy of excitation is of order uh, JZZ. Okay? Um, but now let me decide that uh, I'm gonna flip, um, I'm gonna flip, I'm gonna flip this guy, okay? So yeah, so it was this way, and now I decide to flip it, okay? In any other system, well, that should cost another, you know, energy of order JZZ, because now I would have flipped two spins. But it turns out that if I flip this guy, now this becomes empty. Okay. And now actually, this one, has two in, two out again, so it's not a defective tetrahedron anymore. Uh, but this one has become defective. Okay. And so actually flipping this one, after having flipped one here, hasn't cost me any more energy, so I was able to actually take uh, this two defects apart. And you could actually keep going on this lattice, okay? And you could actually separate these two defective tetrahedra at an infinite distance without any extra cost in energy, okay? Um, uh, so uh, this means that uh, now these particles, which are uh, the monopoles, can have an existence of their own at very large distances, okay? Uh, and the feature here, so say we don't have an entangled state as I want to insist on, here it just comes from the fact that we have a very degenerate manifold and so we are allowed to do this, okay? 
Yes. Yes. Well, uh, yeah, yes, um, It is indeed the spin excitation. Um, so the cost and energy is the same. Uh, whether you've introduced more spin, sorry. Yeah. So I think what happens, it's because you have these, um, um, so say you've acted with S plus, well, I'll say with S minus on this guy. So you've created, here we are, this was I, we did SI minus, so that created a delta as Z equals uh, minus one. Uh, yeah, I don't think this actually matters. Um, so why don't I get back to you? Uh, it's, it's simple, but uh, yes. Yeah, but I'm still worried about the fact that it, it, it's probably this the way this works. I'm just, uh, well, the question was, uh, I've been doing various, uh, I've, I've done spin flips in the system. So am I adding more and more delta S Z excitations, delta S excitations? And so I think the point is that here you flip S Z of that's what also, uh, Quentin, is that right? No, it's not. Yes. Yeah, but I sure. Yeah. But Yeah. Yeah, and then it's fine. Yeah. Oh, oh, sure, but that wasn't. That was yeah. Yeah. So, I guess I was just uh, okay. So maybe indeed I should uh, take it from there. So um, the. Uh, so what, what um, you were asking here was, you know, because I'm act, I keep acting with S plus on the system, I, am I adding more uh, spin, you know, more spin to the system? Um, uh, and so here I was just doing it by hand. So indeed, I think I was just adding more spins to the system. But actually, the way that these spin flips actually happen in reality uh, is that, as we'll see in a second, we actually act with SI as J minus, which are spin conserving operators. And so we're not changing the actually the value of the spin. Okay. Uh, so we actually act with two uh, in the Hamiltonian. So we act with terms that are spin conserving. We, we could also ask about acting with a magnetic field. Okay. So with a transverse field, uh, HSX, uh, for example. But in this case, the, um, 
there is no delta, there is no SD conservation, and so uh, we don't have, you know, spin quantum SD is not a good quantum number anymore, and so this question doesn't, since states are mixed, and so this question doesn't actually, um, there's no relevance to this question. Okay. But here I was just trying to draw a picture, and so I was doing things by hand, and indeed I may have been adding spin to this system. <laughs> okay. But so this is not uh, so crucial. Um, so, um, all right. And so the point is here uh, that we, uh, we, can keep, we can keep moving the defect around without adding any energy to the system, okay? Uh, and in particular, uh, maybe we're, as I was doing it by hand, we're adding delta SZ equals integer spin excitation in the system, but we're not adding any half excitations in the system by acting locally. However, uh, if you, uh, this is not very um, necessarily very well defined, but at least what you can uh, uh, think about is that if now these two particles, which I created locally, I added a delta Z to the system, which was plus or minus one, and now I basically split these two in halves, then it actually kind of means that this tetrahedron carries SZ equals one half, and this other tetrahedron carries SZ equals minus one half. Okay, or one half also. Uh, there are sign issues as was pointed out earlier because it depends on the definition that you take for up tetrahedra and down tetrahedra, et cetera. But there are no real issues, okay, it's just conventions. All right. So in this sense, you can actually sort of see the fractionalization uh, in this system. Okay. All right. So these are the excitations, and so we have basically the energy spectrum here is that we have the ground state, uh, E naught, and then we have many degenerate states here. And then we have, again, um, the E1 here, which this is of order JZZ, and we have many degenerate states at this first level excitations, which are these um, pairs of monopoles that are excited into the system. Okay. Let me now move on to the quantum model, unless there are any questions on this. Yeah. So it's never, there are no spins at the centers of the tetrahedra. Yeah, no. Uh, yeah, so yeah, this is not at the center, this is a, so I think with Collins lecture, you'll see what the particle lattice looks like a little bit better, because I guess you'll have slides and stuff, but I don't know. I'm setting you up, Colin. <laughs> All right, uh, so this was just a very uh, finely tuned model here, uh, but actually at the general uh, nearest neighbor uh, symmetry allowed model, uh, has four exchange parameters and so this is the most general Hamiltonian you can write. So as I mentioned yesterday, in principle, you know, a, a spin Hamiltonian doesn't take the simple forms that you've seen, especially when there is spin orbit coupling. It's not just Ising or Heisenberg, but actually uh, it can be much more complicated. And so in principle, we have these guys, which may be all these exchange constants, which may be constrained by symmetries. And actually, indeed, if you have the symmetries of the parochlor lattice, uh, then you actually end up with a Hamiltonian, which maybe I'll keep on this side, okay? Because that'll be good. Because I don't want to write it too many times. 
What time is it actually, if you don't mind? Okay, well, all right. Uh, so this general Hamiltonian here, constrained by symmetries, is gonna be H quantum spin ice. And it's here. And it's gonna be this term, I promised, this term. So remember, these are actually local axes. And then you have another term. So these are the spin conserving terms I was talking about before. So these two would just be an XXZ model, okay? Um, and then you can write down extra terms, but maybe we won't discuss them at all later, but I'll just write them down to show you what the symmetries allow you to write. And it takes a stranger form. Uh, SJ minus, and then you can also do the, exchange the two uh, IJ terms. Okay, and then there's yet an extra one. I'll tell you in a second what zeta is. Uh, Okay, where the zetas and betas, they're basically uh, they're e plus or minus one, two plus three over one, two. And they're there uh, because of the symmetries. So these you find what these coefficients should be because of the symmetries at symmetry constraint. And so what you see here is that if you just take the first two term, that would just be a so-called XXZ model, which still uh, preserves a U1 symmetry, okay, because it's spin conserving, so it's, well, it's SZ spin conserving. And the other two terms here uh, uh, are not spin conserving, but it's actually, uh, that is actually fine because our model is completely spin orbit coupled, so all the symmetries are broken, and so there is no reason to have any SZ conservation. Just if you fine tune the model to have these two guys be zero, then you would get an XXZ model, which ha still has some uh, SZ conservation. Okay. All right. Uh, and so the idea uh, here is to say that this is much larger than all of these other ones, and so that we can do a perturbation theory, and we should think about perturbation theory out of this degenerate manifold. Uh, and I've been really, really slow. Um, so, um, okay. Um, so out of simplicity, let me just, uh, at this point, just take these two terms to be a zero. They're actually not essential. Uh, They're not essential to actually get the spin liquid ground state. Uh, what is essential are the first two terms. Uh, and so doing a degenerate perturbation theory, uh, what you actually uh, obtain, so you can do, for example, uh, so using uh, J plus minus be much less than JZZ uh, and doing, for example, uh, Brillouin-Wigner 
perturbation theory. Uh, what you actually obtain is that the, uh, so I don't have time to discuss this, um, but it'll be in the notes. Um, it's kind of a little bit of a fun exercise. Um, and so uh, what you obtain actually is that the effective Hamiltonian, so what you're looking after when you do this kind of degenerate perturbation theory is you're looking for what, how will this Hamiltonian uh, break the degeneracy in this degenerate manifold. So you forget about all the excited states. So you only focus, basically, you're trying to project back onto this manifold here of the lowest degenerate ground states. Um, and uh, to try to find what the Hamiltonian, due to this guy, acting only on the projected uh, ground states is. And so that's the effective Hamiltonian. And uh, the first, uh, so the first non-zero, uh, non-constant uh, term appears at third order. So you have to do third order degenerate perturbation theory on this lattice with this Hamiltonian. And what you obtain is actually that the effective Hamiltonian is minus 12 j plus minus uh, cubed over jzz uh, and then the sum over all the hexagons, the small hexagons in the lattice, s uh, S1, uh, I don't have it right there. I'll just, um, okay, uh, where this means that these guys belong to this hexagon I'm talking about, and I'll tell you what the hexagons are. Okay. So, uh, so as we've kind of seen, well, actually, I could draw it here. So you might realize here that actually there are hexagons that appear in the lattice. Okay, and so the hexagons I'm talking about are these hexagons here, and so I'll take spins across, doesn't matter where you start, it's just the product of these guys. And so, um, uh, this is uh, how this is rewritten, okay? So this is the term which appears at third order, and you see that it's, that's, oh, there's a two here. You see that it is uh, third order because uh, the coefficient here is cubed, okay? And then I know that it has to be a two in the denominator because otherwise this is not homogeneous to an exchange constant. Uh, and you indeed get the six, you know, you get contributions, uh, uh, three contributions from each of these quadratic terms here. All right. Um, so now the whole trick here and what we'll see, uh, actually, is we'll see that electrodynamics, quantum electrodynamics, emerges on the lattice. Because um, it's quite special, okay? Um, because one might not have expected that electrodynamics appears on the lattice. Okay. Um, uh, and so in order to see this appear, uh, what we like to do, and this was, so actually all of this was the first and second terms was due to... Uh, Hermely and Valence in 2004. 
Um, and uh, the rewriting that we can do to see electrodynamics uh, emerge uh, is as follows. So we'll just define on the lattice these variables E R R prime to be S I, where uh, now instead of defining a spin by the index i, instead of defining the position of this spins by its index i, I'll define it by the two indices of the two tetrahedra it's neighboring, taking the first index, say, to be one on the up tetrahedron. So this would be r r prime, and in this case, I'll just define uh, i to be uh, r r prime. It's just a new definition of what I is, just a new relabeling. Okay? Uh, and then I'll define this to be uh, SI plus. Okay. Uh, all right. Uh, and uh, when I do this, uh, what I actually see is that if I replace this in this effective Hamiltonian, what I see is that I have H effective equals K um, uh, e to the I A um, hmm. So what I have here is that, you know, if I did S1 and then I called it uh, e to the S1 plus and I called it e to the I A, it's just a little labeling issue here, but let me say A B. Uh, so then I'd have this. And so then S1 plus S2 minus would be e to the I A a B minus I A um, say C B plus etc. And this just becomes the line integral. If I define now the line integral on the lattice as just this discrete sum uh, as becomes this thing. Okay. Is that clear for everybody? If it's not uh, yeah. Uh, because this is going to be very useful in a second. <laughs> um, and what actually exists is that E A is I. And so this actually indeed corresponds to the raising operator. So if you just thought about, um, I, I wrote this down uh, yesterday. Um, uh, you know, you have, there might be, might be plus or minus one, I don't know, uh, but it's consistent. And if you have LZ and the phase, so you think about of a particle on the circle with some phase phi here, this is also I, and actually you know uh, that uh, e to the I phi is actually the raising operator for LZ. Kay. Because if you uh, do this, um, and then you have a fa, well, I can't do it live right now, I'm gonna mess it up. Um, but so, basically if you have a state M, which is a eigenstate of LZ, um, then this is just some 
Und phi e to the i phi m times the phase phi. Um, and so if you act with some e to the i uh, phi operator on this guy, uh, this is just equal to sum phi e to the i phi m e to the i phi phi and then sum phi e to the i phi m e to the i phi phi and then this is just sum over phi e to the i phi plus one no m plus one phi phi and this is just m plus one the A and the C's. These guys? Uh, yeah, I think I said, so it's again all a matter of notation. Uh, I think I said that this I, so you could define it either was the first index being the up tetrahedron or the down tetrahedron, and I said this should be the up one, and then this should be the down one. And so then I want to say, that um, I think it has to be the case that A R R prime equals minus A R prime R. Um, no. Okay, so this all this all checks. Okay. Uh, anyway, this discussion was just to tell you that this kind of made sense because actually e to the i a is the raising operator for e. Uh, and so, um, just because, just like it works for angular momentum, uh, and so indeed we know that S plus is the raising operator for the SZ. Okay, so this makes sense. But the important fact here uh, is that it's going to be useful. What time is it, please? See. Um, it's going to be useful to make electromagnetism appear. Okay. So it's just a rewriting, so at this point we've really not done very much. All right, okay. Uh, and so this effective Hamiltonian, now uh, I can write um, K, you know where K is, uh, I re-erased it, but it's just, um, Uh, is actually k, um, and then because we have the Hermitian conjugate, cosine, and then I'll say curl of a, uh, two. Um, if I define the lattice curl, uh, um, to just be uh, just a definition uh, to be this thing, which is basically related to this Stokes theorem. I guess I started writing small again. Um, sorry. Okay. Okay. Um, now, uh, there's one thing, and so this looks kind of like B, okay, and if I make the, uh, well, I'll do it in a second, but if I made the, uh, um, it's not gross angle, it's just like, um, 
bad. Uh, what's the best name? Mm. The maybe unjustified approximation. Uh, there should be a minus here. Sorry, should be a minus. Um, that uh, this was small, then this would actually be uh, basically some constant minus um, will be plus k b squared. Okay, and this we'll discuss in some uh, other lecture, maybe the last lecture. Um, so uh, then uh, there's another thing which I haven't done because indeed I, you know, wrote this definition and obviously what I'm trying to get to is to get to a Hamiltonian which is going to be E squared plus B squared and so I'm going to tell you this just describes electro uh, quantum electrodynamics. But here I have to be careful a little bit because E uh, is actually um, SZ and so it should be uh, uh, plus or minus one half, okay? And so there is one way that you can enforce this, so uh, you want E uh, to be plus or minus one half, uh, and so you want to enforce this uh, by, for example, taking U uh, to be large a priori, and you want to say uh, that you want to include a term in the Hamiltonian which is e squared minus one half. And so this will enforce this constraint, and then this Hamiltonian is the effective Hamiltonian, the Hamiltonian that interests us for the low energy theory uh, of the of the system in the you know away from the uh, well, uh, starting from the degenerate manifold of classical spin eyes. Uh, and so if I put things together, I actually have that the Hamiltonian the final effective Hamiltonian described in my system is actually, if I just drop constants, is uh, u over 2 uh, e squared plus k b squared. And I guess if I'd rewritten things differently, it would be k prime over 2, k prime is, say, 2k. Okay. And this is actually exactly the Hamiltonian for quantum electrodynamics. And so what we are seeing here is actually when you do degenerate perturbation theory of this guy, so if you, in your system, and your lattice, and your little uh, sample here, actually have this uh, Hamiltonian uh, with j plus minus small compared to jzz, and such materials actually should in principle exist because there are tons of these um, uh, uh, pyrochlor, uh, rare earth pyrochlores, well actually the Hamiltonian that describes your low energy physics is just quantum electrodynamics. And actually the magic here is that we know what uh, quantum electrodynamics is because it's been solved uh, by people before us. Uh, so what you should actually expect is that the ground state of this guy, so the ground state, this actually describes our pyrochlor lattice, okay? It describes quantum electrodynamics in a different context, but it also describes the physics of the spins on our lattice. And so you should actually expect uh, that the ground state of this uh, um, uh, actually is such that you have uh, a, uh, a photon mode and that's what, what when you uh, include matter and so that's what we'll do I was hoping to do today let's see uh, this is this will describe the photon mode but once you include matter which I haven't done yet you'll also get um, some electric monopoles And because there is no reason on the pyrochlor lattice, we're not, you know, in, in, the, in our universe, uh, we're in the pyrochlor universe, there can also be magnetic monopoles. Because in our, uh, in our pyrochlor universe, 
uh, you don't necessarily have divergence of B uh, is not necessarily zero, so nothing prevents you actually from having these magnetic monopoles. Yeah. Uh, it's not the ground state, it's low energy physics, yes. Absolutely. So, uh, sorry, yeah. Uh, these are, so the excitations we're gonna have, the low energy excitations, the low energy physics is gonna be by described by these photon modes. And then if you include matter, so if you include gap matter, so then you have to go a little bit to also include some excitations. It's not described exactly by this effective Hamiltonian. Then you have these gapped uh, excitations which would correspond, you know, to your electric positron and electron and positrons, and then similar quantities, but for magnet magnetic monopoles. Yes. I think I have a small misunderstanding. Yes. So we can see by construction that we can form magnetic monopoles. Yes. Okay. Yeah. But also we can see that if we let B be parallel, right, and then we take the dim of B, we must also where is the parallel? This is, this, this is only the uh, low energy physics. Mm -hmm. So there, there is no such things. So <coughs> this only describes, uh, so this was taken out of the vacuum, which was these degenerate states. Uh, and the states here, right, we were, when we were trying to figure out what H effective was, it was only concerning this manifold. We were projecting onto this manifold, completely forgetting about these excitations. Where, and so in this uh, region here, so in vacuum, also in, elect in, in just your, your usual universe, you're at divergence of V equals zero. It turns out you have divergence of B equals zero. Um, once you start including electrons and positrons, then you can have, you know, these, uh, so your electrons with these guys, fl flux lines coming out of it, and so you have divergence of V. But in this, so it will see in a second how to describe the matter. And this can't be done of this, this degenerate perturbation theory. You have to go beyond this. Okay. And so basically, uh, um, there is some way to actually, which is which I won't do here, uh, but there is some way to actually get an idea for what the um, this the vacuum, so the ground state, which is the vacuum of this power pair lattice, is, and it's using some uh, Dimer model construction. And actually, the ground state. Uh, is actually more or less an equal weight uh, superposition of two in, two out states. Okay, so this is a approximate, so this, the, this uh, state here belongs to this quantum spin liquid phase that I'm trying to describe. And so essentially the ground state of quantum spin ice is actually this uh, up, down, up, down for each tetrahedron, et cetera, uh, and then the sum over all of these states, an infinite sum. And this is a single state. So it's not like classical spin ice. So the these, this guy here has broken the degeneracy of classical spin ice into a single ground state. And then the excitations that were in this uh, low energy manifold that were degenerate in classical spin ice now are forming the photons. That's also degenerate. Yeah? Good? More or less? Yes? Mm -hmm. Yes. This, um, well, this actually, you mean because this is going to give you, <laughs> the question was whether in, in, in order to enforce uh, the condition that E should be plus or minus one half, why did I take this and not this, for example? But I guess one uh, answer could be that if you have a Lagrange multiplier, this is kind of 
the way that you would enforce this. Uh, anyway, the simplest way you would enforce this. Um, Yeah, but the problem is there's going to be a minus sign here when you expand this guy. Um. Yeah, but we enforce it through this guy, so... Say that again, sorry. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. 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 Did you hear this? No. <laughs> so, uh, You might be enforcing whether, so the, the important point here that the, it's the fact that E is half integers rather than an integer number. Uh, and um, um, and this allows you uh, to do this. Um, so if you had something more complicated, then you might allow that you have seven halves, et cetera, but once you've, uh, agree uh, three halves, five halves, seven halves, etc. But once you've agreed that this is uh, that you have one, that you're looking at the one half terms, then this is um, this is what this would actually be doing. Yeah. Okay, so let's do uh, let's do matter. <laughs> um, quickly. Um, so one way to introduce uh, matter in the system and actually go beyond perturbation theory, so not only, so include terms that may be beyond perturbation theory and maybe also include these guys, okay, to see the effect of these guys and also include uh, these matter fields here. Um, uh, one can, uh, instead of doing this simple rewriting I wrote before, uh, one can actually make a different rewriting, or we would still write SZ uh, equals E, but then we would have S plus actually uh, include, we would be keep keeping track of these defect tetrahedra, and we would say that uh, um, that uh, what we want to do is not only keep track of the spins, but also keep track of the defect tetrahedra, which we are creating when we go beyond this uh, perturbation theory. And so what I showed you before is that every time that you flip a spin, okay, so if I call this RR prime, RR prime, RR prime, uh, every time you flip a spin, you create a defect at tetrahedron R and at its nearest neighbor, tetrahedron R prime. Oh, I'm done, that's what you're saying. Hmm. Okay, um, and so if you actually uh, plug, so this is uh, an exact rewriting providing there are some constraints here. You always want to have constraints when you're in larger Hilbert space to come back to the original Hilbert space. So provided you have this uh, constraint here, 
Uh, actually, when you rewrite, so you're completely allowed, this is exact, it's not like before, this is an exact rewriting. And so if you plug this into the Hamiltonian, uh, so all these terms here, you really just plug this in and see what happens. Uh, what you actually obtain is that you obtain that the quantum spin ice Hamiltonian uh, is a hopping Hamiltonian. So it has some phi dagger, R phi, R, some other site, which may be second neighbor. Uh, in the background, of uh, fluctuating uh, gauge fields. Uh, and once you've done this rewriting, you can do mean field theory and actually eventually obtain a phase diagram. But you couldn't have done mean field theory out of the original uh, spin model because then there's no way regular mean field theory, so Curry-Weiss mean field theory, can ever give you a uh, quantum spin liquid ground state, it's always gonna give you an ordered ground state. So you can do mean field theory once you've actually uh, carried out this rewriting, and I'm out of time. So we'll see, uh, we're almost done, but we'll see, um, we'll see the rest uh, tomorrow. <laughs>